Good evening, and welcome to Behind the Shadows. My name is Susan Finelli, and I am your host and author of Behind the Shadows, a program where we go behind the shadows of what meets the eye. Tonight, we will be going behind the shadows of discrimination in the law firm, and excuse me, in the workplace. This is a program where you may want to throw in a tape to share with friends and relatives. Tonight's guest is Richard Cohen. Richard is a partner in the New York office of the, in the national law firm of Fox Rothschilds. Richard possesses more than 30 years of experience litigating and arbitrating complex employment, corporate and commercial disputes. He is a trusted advisor to business owners, both in the United States and internationally. Richard's clients range from individuals and small businesses to multinational corporations. Richard has tried numerous cases in federal and state courts and has conducted numerous arbitrations before the American Arbitration Association and other dispute resolution forums on issues that have involved employment-related matters including discrimination, harassment, restrictive covenants, and business non-compete, and trade secret and confidential business information protection. He regularly appears before the EEOC and other federal and state administrative agencies. Richard has also counseled business owners and human resource professionals with anywhere from five to 50,000 employees regarding equal opportunity and other regulatory and administrative compliance issues. Richard, welcome to Behind the Shadows. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you. Uh, and this is such an important uh, topic that we're going to be discussing. Uh, and you have such a breadth of knowledge. But I'd like to take our audience back to the beginning of your career. Uh, and I understand okay. when you were maybe about 25 uh, and you were interested in discrimination then. And you got involved in a prison discrimination lawsuit. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, it appeared that uh, from a friend of mine who did work in some of the, the prisons in the area um, that there was a there appeared to be a discrimination situation in one of the uh, uh, municipal prisons in the New York area. Uh, apparently, the prisoners who were Muslim prisoners that they were all um, either African American or from the the uh, the, the uh, islands down in the Caribbean. Uh, they were being discriminated against, I believe, because they were not being served food that was consistent with their religion, mm -hmm. which is called halal food right. in the Muslim religion. Mm -hmm. um, that, I thought, was, a, was a, a violation of their religious freedom, their religious rights. But in addition, Jewish inmates were getting served kosher food if they requested it. Mm -hmm. um, thought that wasn't fair. It also violated, in my opinion, the, the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It was an, a violation of the First Amendment religious freedom and the 14th Amendment's right to equal protection under the laws. Right. So uh, we filed a lawsuit. Um, the inmates actually filed lawsuits. I came in and, and counseled them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, uh, the prison authorities were not very happy about, about this. Um, the, the situation changed drastically just having counsel there. And um, I, I took tours then, met with the inmates. Um, the, the federal judge who was involved was not particularly sympathetic at first. Mm -hmm. In fact, he said to me, uh, I'm not going to be the arbiter of, uh, of a situation where um, an inmate uh, wants to eat, like he said, the Four Seasons. Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these pork chops versus sirloin steak, I'm not going to do it. I said, Judge, Judge, you should see the kitchens there. One of the assistant wardens had to give me a, a chicklets to eat because he said this will dampen the smell. It won't, you, it won't make you so sick going oh into the goodness. kitchen facilities. Oh my so goodness. So it was a lot of persuasion to get the judge to understand this was a serious issue. This wasn't sure. an issue of, uh, of, of uh, uh, pork chops uh, right. against lobster. No, it was the, 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 they bless the food the same way the rabbis bless kosher was, food. In fact, in fact, as I learned, uh -huh. um, not being particularly religious myself, but what I learned was that Muslim inmates have a right or have a, uh, an ability to eat kosher food because kosher food is stricter oh, I see. than their food, than their, their halal food. food. So, so at the end of the day, you won this lawsuit. Well, at the end of the day, we told we convinced the court that they could eat kosher food. Right. The Jewish inmates do eat kosher food. Right. 
uh, we convinced the court that, in fact, this was a skeptical judge to begin with, that, in fact, it was unfair right. what was going on and unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. And the judge forced a settlement so that the inmates were able to have halal food or kosher food, or kosher food. to the same, uh, same frequency as the Jewish inmates right. had kosher food. So, so your passion for, for rights uh, goes way back to the beginning of your career. Right. Well, this, this was a pro bono a case pro bono we did. Case. Um, yes. And, and I, I believe very strongly in, in equality under the law, and, and I, I, I will take a case, certainly, that I, I, I believe uh, you know, is on the fault lines, which is this case involving Muslim inmates, mm -hmm. inmates in particular, in uh, it's something yeah. that really, really uh, motivates me. All right. So let's, uh, let's fast forward okay. now to uh, 2011 and talk about discrimination and discrimination cases, uh, workplace related. And I understand, I've, I've read that they're on the rise, the cases. Uh, and why is that so? Why do you think that so many people now are attuned to their rights? Well, that's, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that the number of discrimination um, claims uh, as claims has increased, but the number of cases has increased. You're absolutely right. Because people recognize their rights, mm -hmm. and because the laws are slowly, fitfully, and not without a lot of struggle on the part of individuals being broadened to include more people. So that, for example, uh, gay people, lesbian people, and transgendered people are now mm -hmm. becoming protected under the, under the civil rights laws. Right. Um, the economy ha has, uh, has a big factor in this. The economy is bad, people get fired, people get uh, demoted, people are cut in their benefits. Um, there's, a, there's a chance it could be discriminatory. Mm -hmm. um, discriminatory means that, in fact, they are being treated differently, disparately, because of some category, some immutable category that they have, or that they're a member of, such as a race, gender, disability, age. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, you can show that that these categories, these factors, mm -hmm. uh, um, were the motivating factors behind some employment action that was taken against them that was adverse to them, then you, there's, a, there's a case. Now, sexual orientation, that is that covered? And also, are war veterans covered, covered also? Yeah, well, the sexual orientation is covered um, only under the New York City and the New York State laws. Um, I'm talking now in the New York City area. It's not covered under the federal laws. Uh, federal Title VII is the law that's, uh, that's the omnibus civil rights law that we talk about, generally speaking. Um, but it's only covered state and city. And state is only recent. Um, now, the state rule, so, if, so in New York, someone in New York can bring that case even though it's not a federal rule? Right. It's cumulative. Okay. You, have rights, you have rights to, be, uh, to work in a workplace that's not discriminatory that's not harassing, mm -hmm. that's not poisoned by discriminatory uh, um, comments or actions um, under the, the city laws, the state laws, and the federal laws. Right. So that if you're not covered under the federal laws, there's a good chance you are covered under one of the others. So you can sue under any and all of them. Well, let me ask you this, uh, and it, it's something that just came to mind in, sure. in this discussion. Don't ask, don't tell. It's, a, it's federal. And so, so if there if there's a uh, a military person in a particular state, and they want to sue, don't ask, don't tell. First of all, can they sue? And second of all, what rules? It's federal or state, depending on where they're stationed. Well, that that's comp that gets complicated. Um, number one, the don't ask, don't tell is is something that's uh, that's uh, a little bit different than the typical discrimination case. This is a this is an issue of a federal. Federal law, uh, presidential order. Um, it's of course in flux now. Mm -hmm. uh, I expect that 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 it'll be uh, it'll be something that's way in the past very soon. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than getting into the technicalities right. of where you can sue here, I think that's we should probably talk about something that actually happens that's useful, you know, right. to, to know about right. if you're working in New York if City, you're working or New York in State. New York City, or right. New York State. Oh yeah. So let's talk about uh, employment at will and and. There's no wrongful uh, discharge. Right. It, it, New York State is a state that is pretty conservative when it comes to employment, um, as opposed to California, which mm -hmm. you might expect is right. more liberal. California, yes. 
there is a wrongful discharge. You cannot be fired for wrongful reasons. There's no concept like that in New York. Right. Uh, in New York, you are what's called, and I'm sure people know, an employee at will. At will, yes. You can be hired and fired at will. Mm -hmm. This is an old common law concept. It goes back hundreds of years. It's archaic, but it's still in existence now. So much so that when you look in the legal encyclopedias mm -hmm. to, 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 to find cases on employment at will, the actual headline, the title in the index is Master Servant. Really? You look under Master Servant oh and you get all the employment cases. That's That goes way back. <laughs> but, it, but, but the interesting thing is the law hasn't changed that much mm -hmm. in New York State. You are still, as an employee, the servant of the master, the employer. However, the good news is for employees that you are covered by the anti-discrimination laws. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the few instances where you do have rights if you're the employee. Now, I'm mm -hmm. on the employee side. Um, that means that you may be an employee at will. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have a contract. You have nothing else that governs the terms and conditions of your employment. Right. You can be hired and fired at will, but you can't be treated differently or disparately. You can't have some adverse action taken against you, like being demoted or being fired or not being hired right. based upon the categories we spoke of, your gender, your your age, your race, your national origin, disability. Um, now the uh, the issue of sexual orientation has, has been expanded, so it's covered by state law, right. and it's being and pregnancy status and others. It, it, it's slowly growing now to, to cover a lot more people, and that would also answer your prior question of why are the claims growing? Because the the situations where people are covered is right. being expanded. Well, let me ask you, do you see uh, an increase in in claims and cases of people not getting hired? Do people come and say, I didn't get hired because I'm black, because I'm gay? I mean, do people actually, do you see an increase in those cases? And I, how do you prove it? Well, that, that's that's a tough question. The, 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 my experience is, is um, that the hiring issues are very hard to prove. Yeah. And I don't see too many cases like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't recall one for a long time. Mm -hmm. Most of the cases, most of the cases I see are people who have been excessed. They've okay. been terminated because there is a, a corporate downsizing. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what was told to them. Right. Or because the economy has forced them to merge departments and they get merged out. Mm -hmm. And the issue is, uh, were they merged out, were they downsized because they were just uh, uh, someone who who didn't perform properly or they were the last person hired, or was it something a little more insidious because of their race or their age or disability? Mm -hmm. That's what we see more of, people being treated differently or being terminated once they've already been employed. Right. Well, I, I know that with pregnancy, that's, that's very tricky. Many, many years ago in my career, uh, I had someone working in, in a department who was, was really teetering on the edge, and, and I kept telling her supervisor, you know, you have to document this and so we can go forward. Well, by the time she documented, the woman came and told us she was pregnant. So then there was no documentation, and we, you know, so we had to wait, and then the maternity leave, and so it's really important out there to document. I mean, it's very important because well, I got burned, you know, when I was in the corporate world because the, the supervisor, you know, uh, well, I don't want to, and whatever the story was. Right. Well, well, what you're saying now is probably the most important thing that I counsel employers. I do a lot of work counseling employers. Um, representing employers, and uh, I, I try to avoid litigation, avoid lawsuits at all, all cost. It's expensive. It's time-consuming. It's uh, very distracting for both sides. So, and I've, and I've learned this over the years. It's better not to litigate. It's better mm -hmm. to resolve in some fashion. So I try to avoid the issues beforehand by counseling employers how to act appropriately, how to act legally. And one of the most important things, of course, is to have a handbook setting out your policies. Mm -hmm. But, but as you say, record keeping yes. and, and documenting is very important for the mm -hmm. reason you said. It's very hard, for example, for an employer to terminate a bad employee who is protected, otherwise protected, but in, in some class, in class because of gender or yeah. age exactly, right. and when you have no documentation. Exactly. In fact, it's, 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 it's a situation where you almost want to tell the, the employer, you might as well just settle right now. Yeah. Exactly. Why is it, do you think, that employers are so hesitant, not only to document, but to uh, 
to issue manuals. I mean, as you know, I, I consult in law firms. I can't tell you how many manuals I've drafted that are sitting in closets con collecting dust because they, well, we can't, you know, we can't tell them this. Well, we can't tell them that. And then, and then they just don't do it. I mean, why do you think that is? What's that block? Well, there's, there's a, people, people sometimes are penny wise, pound foolish. Mm -hmm. If they spent a little bit of time getting a handbook, if they don't have one, mm -hmm. or updating it, which is very important Before. if they do, um, they would see a, a major return ultimately if and when someone makes a claim. Uh, even for employers who try to be scrupulous in not discriminating and have mm -hmm. no intent to discriminate, mm -hmm. can and likely will ultimately be hit with a claim by an employee who gets terminated mm -hmm. or doesn't like the way they're treated and somehow even, even manufactures a claim. And um, you know, so people don't want to don't want to provide for some the same way that people who are getting married are loath to enter into a some sort of prenuptial a agreement. Prenuptial agreement, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing. Let's talk a little bit about sexual harassment because this is something that uh, everyone can relate to. Not that it's happening to them, but we read it in the paper all the time. Uh, you know, co basketball coaches and you know managers, and we, we read that all the time. Right. And and what's happening in the hotels in New York City today? I mean, sexual harassment is happening. But in the workplace, what is the definition of sexual harassment other than overtly? I mean, someone well, will come and say, he told me he's, I had someone say, he tells me he likes my perfume, and, and she wanted to do a sexual harassment claim. Well, that, 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 that could be a claim. Whether it would prevail or not depends on a few factors. Um, basically, this is distilling it down to its essence, and it's just a, just a very simple definition. Uh, sexual harassment is basically a, a, a subspecies, if you will, of gender discrimination. Mm -hmm. And it developed from that. And it, it basically consists of two possible claims. One is called a quid pro quo claim, right. which is uh, an, uh, the employer's supervisor, uh, um, when I say employer, I mean the company, company. supervisor uh, of some employee um, comes to a, an employee and asks for sexual favors or threatens some adverse action if they don't get sexual favors. That's the quid pro quo aspect of it. And that is, that is per se harassment. Um, and what, what the employer has to do, should do to be protected is to have a lot of rules and regulations in place and a handbook in place and to have a method and uh, a way for an employee who has been harassed like this to report it, mm -hmm. to have an investigation mm -hmm. done and to have the situation remedied. Right. Um, the second type of harassment, which is much more common, I, I, I think, in terms of what I've seen, is what's called hostile workplace. Mm -hmm. um, you say the comment about perfume. I've right. seen cases where the comments are a lot, a lot more harassing than that. Right. And the courts generally look at that in two ways. They, th they say that if the harassment, if the comments, if the pictures on the walls are are severe enough, mm -hmm. one or two or three incidents right. is enough to make out harassment. Um, if not, if it's not a severe comment like the perfume, it has to be comments made over a period of time to accumulate mm -hmm. so as to suggest harassment. harassment. And, and, and the touchstone of this is, does it poison the workplace? Does it make the workplace uh, difficult and harassing for the employee mm -hmm. enough so that that uh, that the reasonable person will believe this is just not right. Just not right. Well, I know that one thing employers uh, seem to gloss over is the conduct of their uh, clients that come in or their customers that come in. Because uh, again, I, I had a situation where a, a woman came to me and complained because an attorney's client she didn't like the way he was speaking to her. And and they don't realize that yes, this is part of the the harassment in the workplace. Well, an interesting story to I I, I call it the parrot story. <laughs> yes, that might, that so let's might, talk uh, about the parrot story. That might uh, illustrate this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you have to understand that the issue of harassment in the workplace is not who is doing the harassing when it's a question of poisoning the workplace. Mm -hmm. It's a question of is the workplace poisoned for the employee. The parrot case is a real case. I don't know if the bird in Bob was a parrot, but it might have been. <laughs> uh, but, but there was a, a, a fellow in a nursing home or some sort of very, very expensive nursing facility, mm -hmm. I think somewhere in the Midwest, in Ohio perhaps, and it's a real case. And he, he was in a place that was so fancy that he was allowed to bring his animals, his pets in, and he had a, a pet, uh, I assume, 
a parrot who he had in a cage, and it was a very salty parrot, and it li <laughs> liked to shout imprecations of sexual natures to women passing by, and in this case, it was a particular nurse who the parrot fastened his eye on and his vulgarities on. It sounds like and a Seinfeld episode. It, 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 was, it was like this. And, and when I give lectures around, I, I use this example because it's interesting and funny and, and, and very instructive. Um, the, the, the nurse reported this, reported the vulgar parrot to her supervisor. Supervisor, after finishing laughing, said, come on, it's just a parrot, just get over it. And this kept on going on and on, and the vulgarity was a, a lot worse than just a simple, uh, I like your perfume. <laughs> the parrot didn't seem to care about perfume that much. <laughs> and uh, uh, finally, she filed a lawsuit. I, I usually tell the students in these seminars, did she have a good case? Did she have a bad case? And three out of four people say, that's a terrible case. How could you sue a parrot? <laughs> I say, well, that's true. You can't sue a parrot. Anyone else have any thoughts? Okay. It, it turns out that the, the appeals court, the federal appeals court, got it right and said it's not the issue of the parrot, it's the issue of the workplace. Yeah. This person reported to her employer that she was working in a situation that she found intolerable because there was sexual harassment taking place. Vulgarity that she did not want to hear. Right. It didn't matter if it came from the parrot or the person in the bed, right. or the UPS delivery person. Right. It was her workplace was being poisoned, poisoned. by sexual um, harassment, uh, of, of, uh, in, which was a vulgar, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, language spoken. Right. And she won the case. And she won the case. Yes. That's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about if if an employee feels they're being harassed, what steps do they take? Well, it, it it's it's complicated, but generally speaking, an employer should have, as I said before, remedies in place, steps in place. They should mm -hmm. have an EEO uh, or equal employment opportunity person who's designated as such, who mm -hmm. is, uh, the, 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 the name of that person should be disseminated to the employees so they know who to go to if someone is harassing them or they're experiencing harassment. It doesn't have to be harassment even directed at the employee. It could, mm -hmm. be, it could be someone having, uh, hanging vulgar pictures on their own workspace, which mm -hmm. offends another employee. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the employee should know where to go, and, uh, and an employer should do the proper thing, and number one, having already uh, a, a no-tolerance uh, policy in place against such, such behavior and such harassment should then follow up doing an investigation and making sure there's, there's a remedial steps taken, such as isolating the harasser, uh, instruction to the harasser not to do it, uh, other steps to take. Mm -hmm. um, not even, not even uh, excluding uh, termination of the harasser if it's severe enough. Um, but beyond that, if the employee does not get satisfaction, mm -hmm. the employee does, does not uh, um, have the situation remedied, the employee then can then file a claim with the city Human Rights uh, uh, Agency or the State Division of Human Rights or the EEOC, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Right. And ultimately go to court if there's no remedy throughout those uh, different regulatory agencies. Right. Let's talk a little bit about, because this is a case I read, but I didn't read it uh, to, uh, to the end. I don't know what happened. But there was a transgendered individual in a workplace who was denied uh, permission to use the ladies' room. And I'm sure that's a big discrimination case, correct? Well, it's it's a well, it, it certainly something. can be. It certainly <laughs> can be. Yeah. Uh, I had a case like that a couple of years ago before uh, the the rights of of transgendered individuals started to be recognized. Mm -hmm. But I had an employer call me up from one of the southern states where there was a manufacturing facility, and said, "Rich, what are we going to do?" This person was not transgendered, but was, was in fact, uh, I guess, a transvestite, was mm -hmm. wearing the clothes of a woman, but was a man, right. wanted to use the ladies' room. The other employees who were female were opposed to it. Um, very difficult question. We had to understand the layout of the place, how many bathrooms there were, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We decided rather than make this a federal case, literally and figuratively, right. we punted. We said, do you have an extra bathroom? Yes, that is for that employee. And did that employee, was, was he or she happy with that? Very satisfied. Very satisfied. But, but, Someone but may some not. employees might yes. not be because they're being treated differently. Differently, exactly. Some of these things, some of these situations which do come up, and they yeah. come up all the time, there are no easy answers. No. What is uh, illegal retaliation? Uh, well, that's even redundant. Retaliation is illegal. <laughs> right. Um, retaliation is defined as uh, taking adverse steps against an employee 
or against someone who is seeking to be an employee after they have exercised their right to file a claim or a complaint of discrimination. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, I'm an employee, I, I think I'm being uh, denied a promotion because of my gender or my age or some perceived disability, and I make a complaint to my boss. Or I file a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the federal agency, and, I, and because of that, I suffer an adverse action. I am demoted, I am fired, I've seen that. Yeah. Um, I, am, I am put in Siberia in an office uh, well aw away from where I was before. Right. Uh, that is retaliation. It's, it's, it's a particularly dangerous thing for employers not to be aware of this because it's much easier for an employee to prove retaliation than the underlying discrimination. An employee who files a discrimination case, let's say disability, yeah. has a tough task to, to prove that case. Mm -hmm. but, dis but retaliation is much easier. All you have to show for retaliation is that you filed a claim, which mm -hmm. you have a right to do, right. you suffered some adverse action, and, um, and there's some connection between the two. Easy to prove, even if the underlying claim is meritor meritless, I'm sorry. Well, Rich, I can't believe it, but I'm getting cued that we've run okay. out of time already. And I hope you come back and visit us I again will. because we have so much more to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming and sharing your expertise with us tonight. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, our audience, for tuning in. And uh, hopefully you've gotten some good information either for yourself or to share. Uh, if you've missed any of our episodes, you can go to my website at www.behindtheshadows.com and click on Public Access Television. If you'd like to contact me to uh, have me explore a topic you would like to learn about, you can contact me at susan at behindtheshadows.com. And until next time, remember, the brightest light shines behind the shadows. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very Did much for having me. Did it just fly by? Certainly will.